Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on ultrasound for fluid status presented by Dr. Ashika Jain. During this presentation, participants will learn about how including ultrasound evaluation provides a more complete picture compared to CVP alone, and how the fluid assessment exam can be done rapidly and repeated as needed. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this educational activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Jane has no disclosures. AIUM staff members and individuals involved with planning this activity also have no disclosures. During the presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may submit them by typing them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now we're pleased to present Dr. Ashika Jain. Hi, hello, can everyone hear me? Um, my name is Ashika Jane, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about ultrasound for fluid status. And just to give you some of my background, so I'm an emergency physician and have a, a background in trauma critical care as well as emergency ultrasound. And so admittedly, this is probably one of the most useful tools I have in the emergency room as well as in the ICU since fluid status is often a question that comes up um, at the patient's bedside. So this is sort of my version of the things that I do um, when, when that question does come up. So as Kathy had mentioned, unfortunately I have no disclosures. Um, I wish I did, but I do not. And so the, the patient that we're talking about is the patient who is presenting with some definition of shock, right? A state in which perfusion is compromised. And, and there are, of course, different types of shock. This is not the type of shock that we're going to be talking about today, but I feel like you can't have a discussion about shock without having a Macaulay Culkin shock to some degree. Uh, but these are the types that we're going to be talking about. So there's cardiogenic shock versus neurogenic, uh, obstructive, distributive, or hypovolemic for that matter as well. And in all of these cases, there's something that's wrong in the system, right? So if you if you take a you know a, a, an animated view sort of of what the system looks like, there's either a problem with fluid, uh, simply an, enough fluid in the system. There's an obstruction somewhere along uh, along the way, so an obstructive pattern, versus a pump failure, right? If there's cardiogenic shock, you might see a pump failure, and then of course tissue dilation or distributive shock, right? And somewhere along the way, there will be um, there will be a disturbance, there will be a failure in the system, and that will lead us to that state of shock, essentially. So how do we know what type and how do we monitor for it is sort of both the big question. And there are a number of ways in order to do that. Right? There's, there's a long list here, and this is only really touching on the surface of those. Uh, and, and of course, there's the gold standard, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which again, is a wonderful tool, 
Um, it allows us to measure the pressures, systolic, diastolic. Uh, it gives us cardiac output. We're allowed to measure mixed venous oxygen saturation and oxygen consumption. You can then tell us about things like preload and contractility as well as afterload. However, it is um, sparred with lots of data now that's coming out about how it is dangerous. It, doesn't, uh, it also does not provide any necessary benefit to patients. And that, that uh, conclusion is growing, as you can see. There are many journal articles that have come out over the years discussing the, the less usefulness. Um, it is more expensive. It is less effective and, and is, to some degree, equivalent to increased ICU days. So, so now while the gold standard is still the gold standard, um, they're all alternatives to some degree. Uh, CVP had become very popular, so to say, in, in the aftermath of the pulmonary wet pressure. However, even CVP has been, has been shown now in multiple systematic reviews to have, uh, to have less predictive value in and of itself and a loan value in two big studies, in two big um, review studies, to have about a, a sensitivity and specificity of about 50%. So the analogy being you might as well flip a coin if you were going to use CVP as a useful tool. So, so what are alternatives to CVP then? So there are many, uh, and if, if you work in an emergency room, this is probably what your uh, ultrasound machine looks like. This is what mine looked like, in fact, uh, as much as, as early as last night. Uh, it often becomes our tray, but it is one of the most used things that, that we have in our emergency room, essentially, right? So to take a step back, when we start using the ultrasound machine, uh, again, just like CVP, alone most of the data points aren't very... Uh, aren't very sensitive, but when you start adding more things to them, more data points, then, then the picture of what's happening with our patient becomes a lot more clear. So for example, if you were to look up at the night sky and, and I showed you something similar to this, and I said, tell me what constellation this is, you probably might have a hard time understanding what you're looking at. But the more data points you add to it, right, the more stars you can see, the slightly more obvious it starts to become. And then when you have even more data points, it becomes even more obvious that you're looking at Orion at this point. So it's the same idea. One, any one star, any one data point isn't as useful as the whole picture together. So what is that whole picture? We're going to look at a bunch of different calculations. And there are a couple different views that we're going to be going through. We're going to look at parasternal long, parasternal short, the apical four chamber, and, and the IVC. And with, with those few views, uh, we're going to be able to do a bunch of different calculations and look at a bunch of different things, uh, namely endpoint septal separation to look for ejection fraction. We can uh, calculate cardiac output as well as a systemic vascular resistance, um, stroke volume variation, and, and of course the added IVC as well. And when you put all of these together, it gives you a sense of what's happening uh, at the preload, what's happening in, in the afterload, um, as well as what is the ejection fraction. So can my patient handle some of the therapies that I want to do, or just things for me to be weary of as I continue to resuscitate my patient. So what do some of these uh, views look like? So again, this is when we talk about parasternal long and parasternal short. Uh, these are all in relation to the heart, not necessarily to the, to the body itself, but namely to the heart. So parasternal long is in the long axis of the heart compared to the short axis of the heart. From there, you can move on to subxiphoid um, and then continue on from there. So this is what a parasternal long should look like. It's the normal function of the heart. And here you should be able to see things like the RV at the top of the screen, your aortic outflow tract, which is usually delineated by parallel lines of the aorta, so it's a nice sort of uh, quick way to find the, the parasternal long view. So oftentimes one of the most frequently uh, noted first things to find when you're looking at the, the long view, as well as the left ventricle and the left atrium. And you can see uh, in between these things 
uh, the mitral valve between the left atrium and ventricle, and then the aortic valve between the ventricle and the aortic outflow tract. And then below it all, you can see sometimes catch a glimpse of the descending aorta as well. Here's another view of the parasternal lung. Uh, it's not as exaggerated, but you can see, again, all of those components of the heart. You get a sense of what's happening, how the heart is squeezing. Um, and it gives you a nice shot of that, of that mitral valve and that septum. And you know you've got the right cut um, to, to start making estimations and calculations when you can see all of these things, when you can see the valves line up with the ventricles, uh, with the ventricle, excuse me, and the, the atrium as well as the aortic outflow tract. When you can see all those things, you know that you're in the right cut of the, of the parasternal long view as opposed to an oblique view. If you're oblique and started making calculations, you'd be underestimating or overestimating uh, someone's EF or um, uh, sort of what their overall picture looks like. So from parasternal long, if you turn your hand 90 degrees, then you get to the parasternal short view. And in the parasternal short view, it gives you a nice sense of what are, what are the wall motions doing? Um, do I have an anterior wall motion abnormality? Uh, if I, do I have a lateral or a septal wall motion abnormality? Remember, the heart squeezes concentrically, so if you, you should feel like if you stick your finger in the center of that ventricle, it would squeeze around your finger. Um, and that would be normal contractility, essentially. So moving from, from parasternal long, if you keep your hand uh, right over the ventricle, and you keep the ventricle in, your, in the center of your view, and you move your hand towards the, the left hip, it should get you to apical four. Here's another view of parasternal lung in a patient who has poor contractility. Again, you can see the difference between that previous slide and this one. If you stick your finger in the center of that ventricle, it's not squeezing much, right? It's not going to strangle your finger by any or no means. This is someone who probably has uh, a very poor EF. Um, so what are, we, what are the calculations that we're doing in some of these places? So the first one that we're going to start with is looking at ejection fraction and using the endpoint septal separation to do that. It's an M-mode calculation, and we're going to go through how that happens. Um, and then there's this very simple calculation that you can do. And this is simply a jump-off point. There is some evidence that it, that it works, um, but it, it's not perfect, unfortunately. Um, so again, these are things that you might use as a, as a jump-off point. As you're learning how to, how to do echo, as you're learning how to calculate EF, it allows you to learn, sort of look at the picture and then assign a number to what that picture looks like. Most cardiologists, when they calculate EF, they actually they don't do a calculation. They sort of look at the picture and they say, this looks like about 50% um, injection fraction versus this looks like about 70%. That's why there's always a range to some degree. So now, as you do this more often, you'll be able to assign a number, right? This, this number correlates with an ejection fraction of 50%. Um, and now I know what that looks like, so the next time I do this, as you do this more and more often, you won't have to do the calculation per se. But it is nice to have that, that calculation in your back pocket. So what does that look like? So in parasternal long, you get the M-mode spike and you place that at the very tip of the anterior leaflet. And so in the slow-mo video, you can actually see that, that spike uh, scrolling over to the very tip of the anterior leaflet. And we're looking at the separation, the end point, sep the end se uh, septal separation. So it's the distance between the anterior leaflet and the septum. So once you get to that tip, you hit the M mode button again and it will plot the movement over that one line over time. And it should give you something that looks like this. And so now we're going to measure the distance between the very tip of the anterior leaflet and that septum. So that's what these two points are, essentially. And that will give us a distance. Uh, here's another version of the same thing. Um, we're going to get a distance here. In this case, it's 0 0.52 centimeters. The main thing to make sure that you note is that the calculation is in millimeters. There's a little bit of conversion here. And then you plug that into the calculation, 
And in this particular case, the patient's EF is 62.5%, right? So now you would, you would probably say this patient has, a, has an estimated ejection fraction of about 60 to 65%, right? Again, these are not perfect numbers, but it gives you an idea of where you are. Here's another example of what it should look like. Here's another M-mode uh, plot. And you're, again, you're, you're measuring the difference or the distance between that anterior leaflet uh, and the septum. And you'll see this sort of biphasic movement of the, of the mitral valve, and that's the normal movement of the valve itself. So you should look for that when you're looking for movement of the valve. Our next uh, calculation that we're going to start doing is to look for cardiac output. Now, of course, there are multiple ways to get to the cardiac output. Uh, most of us, in, in the ICU at least, uh, might be using some sort of flow track device or Vigileo device that can do a lot of these calculations. However, not everyone has that A-line to, to do it. Maybe they can't have an A-line for various reasons. Or you haven't set it up yet, right? So you've got a patient who's coming in to the ICU or they're, they've already been there and they're suddenly going into shock and you want to know what's happening. And you can do this exam faster than you can probably place your A-line and get it all set up. So these are those options and those in-between times as well or especially in the emergency room where you may not actually have put in an A-liner that isn't really a, a consideration for you at the moment because there's too many other things going on per se. So how do we calculate cardiac output? Um, it's, if you remember back to our days in med school, it's, it's the heart rate versus the stroke uh, volume. And it'll help us to calculate the, or characterize our type of shock, um, it can be done over and over again to see what our response to our therapeutic interventions have been if you're giving IV fluids, if you're doing other things. Um, you can also optimize this as well as use it to optimize your oxygen, oxygen delivery. So back in med school, we all learned that stroke volume times heart rate equals our cardiac output. And if you, so how do we get stroke volume here, right? Heart rate's easy. We'll sort of look up at the monitor and that, and that number gets told to us. But the stroke volume becomes a little bit more tricky, and so here we're going to go back to all that math we had to do once upon a time as well, and, and we're going to look at the, the left ventricular outflow tract area. So we want to be uh, as close to the other side of the heart as possible here, right? We're looking to see what's happening as the volume leaves the heart. So we're going to do the left ventricular outflow tract area times the left ventricular outflow tract VTI. If you haven't heard about VTI before, it's the velocity time integral, and it's essentially the blood velocity across time uh, and for a period of systole. So it's basically the area under the curve um, of volume that's, that's leaving per pulse, essentially. And, and I'll show you what that looks like very uh, momentarily. So now that going back to the left ventricular outflow tract area, here we're going to use the diameter and then that good old pi r square essentially to do that, right? So uh, in parasternal long, you should see a picture like this. And you can see that, remember those parallel lines we talked about? That's the aorta. And then you'll see the aortic valve just uh, at the beginning of that. And we're going to do our measurement right on the other side of the aortic valve, right? So we're as close to the heart as possible but on the outside, essentially, right? So on the other side of that aortic valve, so that we can see what the stroke volume is as it leaves the heart. So now we have our diameter here. Here's another version of that. Um, here's a, you can see the parallel lines, and then you can see just on the outside of that aortic valve, we're going to do our measurement. So here, our LVOT diameter is 3.76 centimeters. Uh, here's uh, and then we're going to, once you get to apical four view, we're going to use Doppler, again, in that left ventricular outflow track to find our VTI. So place the, the gate right in the center of the left ventricular outflow track. And if you hit uh, pulse wave Doppler again, it will give you something that looks like this. Now, this does require you having a cardiac, um, the cardiac inputs and some of the calculations that are preset in the machine, and so that you can actually trace out the area under the curve for each one of these pulse waves, essentially, right? So what we're looking at is the velocity of the pulse waves as it goes through that gate. Um, and then if we measure and trace each one of those out, it gives us that, 
a velocity time integral, right? Integral is from that, that calculus we had to do once upon a time. So now, now let's put some of those numbers into our calculation. And I, I apologize for all the numbers that are happening here, but if you follow down the yellow, the yellow is the stroke volume calculation. So LVOT area times the VTI or the diameter uh, times the VTI, so pi r squared, and then uh, and then we have that VTI, that, that's a number that we just uh, measured, and as you continue to do this calculation, you eventually get down to uh, that bottom that bottom area where cardiac output is equal to 198.7 mLs per beat times 60 beats per minute, and then that will give you the equivalent of about 11 liters per minute in this particular patient when you do the, the calculation. So Here's our cardiac output for this particular patient. Now the next calculation we're going to do is stroke volume variation. And stroke volume variation is, uh, is really a, a useful tool. It's something that I probably do the most often when, when looking at fluid status. And, and to think about it, some, sometimes people have a little bit of a hard time. And, and the way I describe it is that the jug phenomenon. So, when you have a, a milk jug or any sort of jug, if the jug is half full and you shake the jug, then when the fluid moves around in it, there's a lot of variation in the velocity of the fluid moving around, right? Because it's half full and there's lots of room for that movement. Versus if you have a full jug and you shake it around, there isn't as much variation for that velocity, right? So we're looking at the same thing here. We're going to be using velocity as a marker for, for variation for how much fluid there is in the, in the tank or in our particular bottle, the bottle being us, of course. So this is in the same apical 4 view that we were just in when we did VTI. Um, and this looks very similar to that wave that we were just using for VTI as well. So while you're doing VTI, you can actually also do your stroke volume variation. And what we're doing is we're measuring the velocity here. So now if you look at this, you can see that, that these uh, pulsed waves, they, they kind of go up and down, right? And that's as intrathoracic pressure changes our preload, it will affect our afterload as well. And so you're looking at how that changes over time by respiration, by respiratory variation. So, so now we're going to measure the, the difference between the maximum velocity and the minimum velocity as it changes in a respiratory cycle. And that will be our marker for, for our variation. So the difference between the minimum and the maximum gives us a delta, and that delta is the stroke volume variation. Here's another version of that, and maybe this is a little bit more obvious. You can see that variation as it goes up and down with respiratory changes and with changes in intrathoracic pressure. So here in this case, this patient has a 17% difference, um, which would be equivalent to saying someone was uh, fluid responsive. In most, uh, in most of the, the evidence, uh, normal stroke volume variation, you and I have somewhere between 5 and 10% variation. Uh, greater than 10% is considered elevated, and greater than 13% is considered volume responsive. Right now, again, this is, these are all single data points, so having a low stroke volume variation needs to be taken into consideration with what the cardiac output is and what the preload looks like, right? So now um, we'll get to preload next, essentially. And so we're looking at the IVC, right? So we're looking at the other side of the heart now. And unfortunately, IVC has been riddled with an equivalent amount of data that says that it works as there is data that says that it does not work. But the consistent thought process with all of these is that as single numbers, as single measurements, they are not as useful as they are for collapsibility. Um, and greater than 50% collapsibility is correlative with being um, hypovolemic. And, and again, as a single number, not useful, but as a, as a trend over time has been shown to have some usefulness. So, uh, now we're going to go to sub-xiphoid view, and from, from sub-xiphoid, if you turn your, your hand 90 degrees, then you'll get the long shot of the IVC as it goes into the right atrium, right? So you can see here the heart beating, 
and you can see this vessel that's sort of dumping right into that right atrium. And that's our IVC. And we're looking for the IVC to be obviously uh, inferior to the diaphragm. And you know you have the IVC because the IVC can sometimes be confounded by the, by the aorta, which is in close proximity to it. You know you have the right place when you can see the hepatic vein uh, emptying into the IVC just before the diaphragm. So if you look right here, you'll see that hepatic vein coming right into the picture at the very end there. Uh, coming into the IVC right before it goes into the right atrium. Uh, here's another view of the same. If you can't get this view from subxiphoid, the alternative is in the right upper quadrant, just like you would for a FAST exam. You're just going to move your hand, adjust your, your uh, hand either superior or inferior, depending on the patient's habitus, to find the same IVC, uh, and you'll see the same hepatic vein coming right in just before that diaphragm. So now you can see we're doing M mode here. Here's an M mode spike again so that we actually see how it changes over time. And you want to be a few centimeters uh, inferior to the diaphragm. If you're too close to the diaphragm, you'll have artifact from atrial kick, um, and that will affect the measurements as well. And so by, by coming a little bit further south from the, the diaphragm, it helps us to avoid some of that artifact, essentially. Well, not artifact, but some of those effects, really. So when you hit the M mode spike, you should see something like this, right? So you're correlating uh, that, that time over that one spike uh, over the course of your screen. And then you'll be able to see the minimum and maximum variation of the IVC over time. And, and again, as respiratory pressures will affect the IVC. Now, there is some discussion about ventilated patients. Um, what should be your inspiratory versus expiratory measurements? Is it useful? Um, mo in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, it can be used in awake patients and in ventilated patients. People expect this number, and that is something to consider, which is also why, as an, as an absolute number, this is not as useful as when you do the index, right? So when you actually do the calculation for your minimum and maximum um, to actually see how much it collapses. 50, greater than 50% collapsibility is, again, thought to be someone who is hypovolemic or has a low preload, to be more specific. Here's another view um, looking at the IVC. Here you can see, again, the M mode spike. I'm slightly moving it away from the diaphragm and then and then doing your calculations from here, right? So again, here your index is 0.59, so about 60% collapsibility, which is someone I would say has a low preload here, right? Um, and in this case, you can almost, you don't even have to do the M mode to see that that, that IVC is barely moving when, when there's respiratory change here. You can see that sort of beating of the respiratory variation, and there's very little movement, so here, our index is zero, essentially. Another thing to make note of in this particular view is you can see that at the top of the screen the gallbladder is in this view. And so you just have to account for that when you're looking at the M mode to make sure that you're measuring the correct uh, vessel. It would, you have to make sure that you're not measuring the gallbladder compared to the IVC. In this case, neither of them changes. So that is just something to be wary of is your gallbladder may occasionally be in your view and that needs to be accounted for. So now we've gone through uh, a bunch of these calculations and we've gotten sort of a picture of what's happening with our patient, but sometimes you still don't have enough information. Uh, and so you, you might want to look in a couple more places just to get, add more data points to our constellation, right? Add more stars to our picture. And so you can do the fluid status exam and add the FAST exam. And so this is sort of a, a modified version of a rush protocol to some degree we start adding FAST exams, but we're not looking at the rest of the RUSH protocol. We're not looking at the aorta and things like that. This is really just a sense of, are there other things that I should be accounting for, essentially? So, so the FAST exam, of course, is the, the four views, the sub view, which we've already just seen, but hopefully we're going to, we're looking for pericardial fluid. So essentially we're looking for the pericardial sac. There's a right upper quadrant to the right gutter, uh, otherwise known as, as Morrison's pouch or the hepatorenal interface. 
And again, you're looking in that whole area. Do I see fluid? Do I see anything else happening in there that might explain why my patient is hypotensive? And then there's the left upper quadrant view, or the left gutter. It's the splenorenal interface, but notoriously and anecdotally, fluid, when it first starts to accumulate in this area, may not actually be in the splenorenal interface. It may, in fact, be superior to the spleen itself. So you, again, you have to look throughout this whole area. Uh, and, if, and if I've done nothing today, I've, I've named the left upper quadrant in my own name, since it is not named, but that's a side joke. Um, and, and then the last view of the FAST exam is the suprapubic view. So here you're looking at the cul-de-sac of Douglas, you're looking at the area behind the bladder as well as the area behind the uterus in a female patient to see if there's any fluid here. And again, the idea is that these are the most dependent parts of the abdomen in the supine patient, and so if there is fluid hiding somewhere in there, these are the places to go looking for it. Uh, if a patient is hypovolemic from their, uh, from their traumatic event or from any other thing, this might help to understand why they are hypotensive, essentially. And these are all things that can be done at the bedside. Here are what those views look like. Uh, so we're looking at the four views, the, the pericardium, the, the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and the suprapubic. And these are all normal exams. And then the abnormal... Um, might be very obvious. So in, in this case, this is the, the uh, subxiphoid view looking at the pericardium, and you can see a very obvious pericardial effusion, which would again provide us with an obstructive pattern, right? So this would be someone who um, is hypovolemic, where if you were to relieve this pericardial effusion, you should see an improvement in their cardiac output, in their stroke volume, uh, and in their blood pressure for that matter, so in their, in their hypotension. If you were to have a patient like this one who in their right upper quadrant has, uh, has some free fluid sitting in Morrison's pouch, that could be a source for why they are bleeding as, or why they are hypotensive as well as in the left upper quadrant. So here, here's a picture of uh, no fluid between the spleen and the kidney. However, you can see there's a, an impressive amount of fluid superior to the spleen um, and, and around the diaphragm as well. And I can actually, if you'll, if you'll make a note here in both the right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant view, there's, uh, you can see especially in the right upper quadrant, there's a spinal stripe, there's that scalloped uh, border at the bottom there, and that's the spine, which usually you can only see in the, uh, in the area below the diaphragm because ultrasound waves don't play necessarily very well with, uh, with air. Oftentimes, this deep structure is not visible in the normal patient superior to the diaphragm. However, when you're looking at the diaphragm, or when you're looking at any of these views, and you can see the spinal stripe extend past the diaphragm or, or superior to the diaphragm, that would be indicative of fluid in the thoracic cavity, which, again, should make you think about why this patient is hypotensive. And these are all things to see in all these same views. And then moving on to the suprapubic area, Here's another view of a positive FAST exam, you know, perhaps slightly subtle to some degree, is to see that little pocket of fluid sitting alongside that bladder. So these are all different views that, to add to the constellation of what's happening. And perhaps you might be able to even think about, um, you know, different scenarios where the preload might be low, but the afterload might be really high, or, um, or vice versa for that matter, right? So if you had a very... Um, plethoric IVC with very low collapsibility, but a very high stroke volume variation, then perhaps you might think of something wrong between those two versus uh, something like a, a massive PE or severe COPD or something of that sort, versus if uh, both your IVC were collapsed and you had a very high stroke volume variation and a hyperdynamic cardiac output and EF then perhaps you might think of someone in septic shock, right, where everything is sort of dilated and, and down. Now, of course, this is not a perfect system. There are, there are downfalls and there are things that will make this difficult. Um, when it's simply a matter of, uh, I can almost see what's happening, but not perfectly, and you can't quite get the right views, and especially because the heart, the heart is very well protected in the thoracic cavity, right? So trying to climb in between the ribs can oftentimes be difficult. Uh, 
Turning the patient to their left lateral decubitus position oftentimes helps. Right? It brings the heart closer to the chest wall. It, it, it essentially brings the heart closer to you. And so it might make it a little bit easier to find some of these views, essentially. Um, obese patients it, it also make it a little bit difficult to get some of these views, namely because uh, as you increase depth on our machines, it decreases our resolution. So it becomes a little bit harder to see the subtleties of these changes. Uh, most atrial dysrhythmias, as well as valvular disease, will make calculating things like the EF and the cardiac output difficult because we're, we're relying on normal flow pattern through the valves and through the, the ventricle and atria. So now when there's a dysfunction in there, right, either atrial fibrillation or flutter, um, then, it, then, then looking at those things becomes a lot harder to do and, and therefore those calculations are not accurate, as well as in valvular disease, right? So same idea. It's really hard to calculate end point, separ end, uh, point septal separation when the valve itself is not functioning the way that it's supposed to be. A pneumothorax will also make this difficult. Uh, notoriously, when you have a pneumothorax, the, the heart and the mediastinum uh, start to get pushed, right? And so then it's hard to really actually visualize those, those views. And it's the same idea in COPD. Most COPD patients, when you look at their barrel chest and chest x-rays, you can see how, um, for lack of a better way to describe it, how squished the, the, medi the mediastinum becomes. And that can oftentimes make it hard. It tends to make it, tends to make the mediastinum more medial. Therefore, now you're climbing behind the sternum to see some of these views. The distended abdomen will also affect this. Uh, the diaphragm will be pushed up, and that will affect the, the lie of the, the heart, and that will, again, also confound some of your measurements as well. And then, of course, the bigger one of all of these is that ultrasound is a user mortality. So this might be more difficult for a novice user, but that shouldn't deter you from trying to do this. Obviously, the more you do it, the better you become, the more obvious this picture becomes to you, the easier uh, navigating some of these pitfalls become as well. Um, and so that's that's what I got. That is my that is what I use as as a quick assessment. This is something that I uh, that I can do at least in the in a patient that I'm not having too much difficulty with. Within the first few, I can do this within five to ten minutes, right? So not that long. Um, and ten minutes is is really a long time to spend at the patient's bedtime to some degree when you're trying to do this stuff. But but really, you get a nice sense of what's happening, and it, and most importantly. It can be repeated multiple times as you are resuscitating your patient to see that your interventions are actually working. Um, uh, do, you need to, do you need to switch from fluids to pressors, right? So now your tank is full, but your stroke volume is still really high. Um, so continue to give fluids, but maybe your cardiac output is starting to diminish as you have a cardiomyopathy of some sorts. So this is, again, something that will help to drive your resuscitation as well as monitor it along the way. And on the back end, even as, as time goes by in the, uh, in the ICU after you've been doing stuff, this may also be useful to sort of know when to start withdrawing things as well, right? When do I stop giving IV fluids? Um, what, is my, what does my cardiac picture look like? Am I ready to stop uh, my pressors, right? If I'm on dopamine, is my EF getting better? Is the output getting better that my patient might be able to start uh, compensating on their own for some of the, these things? So again, this is, this is a nice sort of way to put all of those pictures together. Uh, and that's what I've got. If you guys have any questions, uh, let me know so I can answer them. Dr. Jane, it looks like there is one question. Are you able to see it on your screen? If not, I'm happy to read it to you. Uh, let's see. So I have a question here. Uh, in the apical four chamber, measuring the uh, LBOT and VTI. However, it appears I'm in the apical five view in order to obtain the power, the pulse wave Doppler. Um, can you comment? Yes, absolutely. So, so yes, you are absolutely right. It is the apical five chamber. I guess just by name, by uh, by nomenclature, we call it the apical four, but it, in fact, yes, you are absolutely right. It is the apical five view, and that is something that you need to to achieve in order to get to some of these measurements. 
namely because you, as you're in apical four view, if you if you change the angle of your hand ever so slightly so that you're aiming slightly more anterior so that you can open up the left ventricular outflow tract, that is what you're going to be using in order to do these measurements. So yes, that's a great question. Thank you for, for that question. Um, uh, the next question here is, if I have experience with liver um, uh, elastography and evaluation of intravascular fluid overload and heart failure. So admittedly, I, I have not used that very often. Um, so let me take a step back and say that these are the things that, that I use. There is, as I've mentioned earlier, there are more and more applications that are coming forward for usefulness for fluid status, right? So not only using IVC, but looking at carotid, looking at jugulars, looking at femoral, looking at um, elastography in, in, um, for fluid overload as well. I personally have not been using that just quite yet. Um, I'm still getting better at that particular one as well. So, so admittedly, I can't comment on that particular question. Um, and then the next question I have here is the utility in assessing for pulmonary beelines in determining fluid status. So yeah, so that's that's an added um, benefit here. So as you continue to to do your resuscitation, knowing what your limits are, uh, this is a great added benefit for limitations in a patient that perhaps you can't intubate or knowing when that that might happen if you do need to intubate is is a great way. So it, in and of itself, it doesn't tell you about the fluid status, that's why I didn't include it in here, but it does tell you about your resuscitation. Um, it, so using um, B lines to say that I've given X number of fluids and now my patient is developing pulmonary edema, so either I should, I should start to hang back or I need to anticipate a potential intubation is a great added benefit to this, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so, so, there, so the next question I have here is using M mode for IVC, uh, and, and the comment is that you're measuring the IVC at two separate places at separate times. So there's, there is always discussion about how to properly measure the IVC, since as, as you breathe, uh, it moves the IVC or it moves that, that place in, in that point in time. Uh, there is, uh, admittedly, in my experience, there's no perfect way to get around that. There are, uh, it, it still gives you a sense of what's happening. So while the number may be skewed slightly because you are measuring as, as the IVC moves back and forth with respiratory variation, it still gives you some sense of what's happening. Um, again, uh, those numbers are not perfect, and that is something that taken that is a caveat of these measurements. But it does give you still a sense of um, what the collapsibility is. Now, again, as you do this more and more often, you may not even have to do the calculation to to look at the IVC and see that it is totally collapsible or that it is not moving at all. Right at the extremes, IVC becomes useful. It's that middle ground when you when you're not really sure is it is it 40% or 50% collapsibility, then it becomes uh, a lot yet less useful because there is that variation in the measurement. So that is a caveat to take into consideration, absolutely. Um, the next question or comment here is to add that EPSS is not valuable in dilated hearts in the setting of significant MR and AI. Yeah, absolutely, as I would mentioned, um, these numbers are not calculable when you have um, any sort of dysrhythmias or valvular disease. Again, because the mitral valve isn't moving properly in any of those cases, um, being able to do those calculations, it makes it a lot more difficult. So these become unreliable numbers. Um, and that is the case for not only for ultrasound for calculating EPSS um, and EF, but also for flow track and Vigileos and all of our other sort of monitoring devices that we have. These are unfortunately the downfalls um, of not being able to use that pulmonary wedge pressure, which did allow us to use it in those in that setting. However, in this setting, um, any of those those processes that affect the valves um, and affect the the way that the heart contracts become a problem for us in these settings. Um, 
So the next question here is using peripheral arteries for VTI measurement using carotid versus femoral. So uh, for the most part, as of now, most of the, the data is more validated using the VTI and the left ventricular outflow tract. There is data, people are doing this more often, and there is more data that is coming out. It's just not a robust amount of data to, to suggest using peripheral arteries for this. Again, you're, you're trying to compensate this number for stroke volume, and so you want to be ideally as close to the origin of the stroke volume as possible. So, so that is, for the most part, why that calculation as of now is still there. Um, and the next question here is utility of passive leg raise. Absolutely. Uh, passive leg raise is a wonderful tool for, for uh, fluid status, right? It's, a, it's an automatic auto bolus, essentially. So if you raise the legs uh, above 30 to 45 degrees, or 30, you should raise them from 30 to 45 degrees, and, and allowing the patient in the supine position to essentially get about a 15% uh, volume bolus. And that should tell you what's happening as well. Those are other useful tools to add, especially in light of the patients with AFib or all those things that make our calculations a lot more difficult. Um, and so the next question is about lung ultrasound, which I think I already talked about, um, and its utility for, for not not necessarily, it doesn't answer the question of what is the fluid status, but it does tell us about the consequences of our resuscitation, right? So knowing uh, that I'm giving too much fluid or I'm giving so much fluid that now there are other things happening to the patient. And that, again, also goes with the FAST exam. It will tell you what's happening to the patient as you continue to resuscitate a patient. So yes, um, that is a useful tool in this as well. Again, it just doesn't give you the fluid size, but it tells you, hey, I'm giving, I've given my third liter, and now I'm starting to get some pulmonary edema because I see increased V-lines. Perhaps I either stop and reassess, or um, I have to be ready to intubate, or, or maybe I, I will add pressors to help with my hypotension in the meantime, right, so I can slow down my fluids a little bit. And especially as uh, many of you have encountered with CMS and all of our new sepsis measures, they are far more strict in some, giving some of these fluids. So this is, again, something to take into consideration as you continue to resuscitate patients. Uh, I think that's it for the questions that I have. Uh, if, I, if you guys have any more questions, please send them in. Uh, I think we still have some more time here. Um, and if not, uh, I thank you very much for joining me today. Of course, you can reach me. You can email me. Or, and here's my Twitter handle as well. If you have any questions, comments, um, if you uh, have any other thoughts, by all means, please send me send them my way. I would love to hear them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. And our thanks to all of you who attended today. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test. And please join us again for future webinars. So long, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.